Welcome to part two of our lectures on the nervous system. In this video, we're going to talk about how information is transferred from one neuron to the next. Information transfer within a neuron is electrical. That means it involves the movement of charged particles. In this video, we're going to start understanding how all of this happens by describing the process of information transfer between neurons. And this involves taking an electrical signal in one neuron, converting it into a chemical signal that is then exocytosed and released from the first neuron and detected by the second neuron. In both cases, information transfer within neurons and between neurons, specialized proteins are involved. So I've said this before, I'm going to say it throughout the course because it, it, it bears repeating and it's the key to understanding a lot of cell biology and about the function of our our bodies. Rules, quote unquote, rules to remember when you're considering how proteins work. Proteins often change shape when another molecule binds to them. When you have a shape change, that may lead to a change in what the protein is capable of. And a change in shape can then also allow that protein to bind or unbind yet another molecule. So let's take a look at some of these specialized proteins. Last week we talked about channels through the plasma membrane, right? Um, and that those kinds of channels are necessary in order for charged or polar molecules to move through the cell membrane. So now we're going to add another layer to that understanding. What we're looking at, the gray bar on both the top and bottom, bottom panel of this illustration represents a phospholipid bilayer. The green, blue, and red shapes represent different kinds of protein channels. I think I mentioned last week that channels through the membrane can be always open or they might have a gate on them. Right? And a gated channel is exactly what it sounds like. It's a channel or a pathway through the membrane that has a gate on it. And gated channels are opened with one of, or by one of three different methods. They can be opened by a change in voltage. So those are called voltage gated channels. Remember the sodium potassium pump sets up a difference in electrical charge inside and outside the cell. Voltage gated channels open when there is a change in charge across the cell membrane. And each different type of voltage-gated channel opens and or closes at a different charge. So that's what we're seeing in the first panel, right? You've got positive charge outside, negative inside when the gate is closed. When the charges flip, that leads to a shape change in the channel, and now material can move through based on concentration gradient, right? So this is an example of facilitated diffusion. Next, we have what are called ligand-gated channels. Ligand is just the name for one molecule that binds to another. So the ligand is red Right, you can see the little binding pockets on protein number two here. 
when nothing is bound to this protein, it's closed. But when you have ligand bound, the channel opens and that allows material to pass through the channel based on concentration. The third kind of channel is called a mechanically gated channel. Mechanically gated channels are um, closed when the neuron is subjected to one kind of force, squeezing, think about it that way, when it's squeezed in one way and open when the cell is squeezed in a different way, right? And these are how the pressure receptors in our skin work. So as the mechanical forces on the cell change, that can either close or open a mechanically gated channel. The two ch types of channels that are going to be the most important for us in this introduction to how the the uh, neurons communicate with one another are voltage gated channels and ligand gated channels. All right, now that we have that basic information, let's get into more detail about how information transfer between neurons happens. As I said before, it's in the form of packets of chemicals, which we call neurotransmitters, and it happens at specialized areas between two neurons or between a motor neuron and a muscle cell that is referred to as a synapse. This quote, you are your synapses, they are who you are, I think is, is really telling. When you learn something new, what happens is you are altering the structure of your brain on the level of the synapse. So the synaptic structure of your nervous system is the sum total of all of your experiences and everything you've learned, which essentially is who you are. So as, as I've said, a synapse is a specialized area of where two neurons come together. And the neurons don't actually touch. That's something it took um, over 100 years to establish um, because the distance between them is so small that um, when you look with a light microscope, it does look as though they're contacting one another. The gap in between the two neurons is called the synaptic cleft. Messages from the sending cell, right, and I can tell that's the sending cell because this is marked as axon, and I know axons are the parts of the cells that send messages. So this means this is the receiving cell. The message crosses that physical gap because the sending cell releases packets, exocytosis packets of molecules called neurotransmitters. So a neurotransmitter is what transmits or passes on a neural signal. These diffuse across, the neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to our friends, the ligand gated ion channels. Now, let's unpack that a bit. So we've got ligand gated, right? We've got channel, cool. Ions are what move through these channels. Ligand gated ion channels are also called neurotransmitter receptors because they are receiving the signal and their response to see, receiving the signal, which is receiving the signal, means that the ligand, the neurotransmitter, has been bound, is to open an ion channel and allow 
charge to flow into the receiving cell. And that is then going to change the amount of charge inside neuron number two. Little bit more vocabulary. So as I said, synaptic cleft is the term we use for the gap between the sending and receiving neuron. The sending neuron is referred to as presynaptic. Pre means before. The postsynaptic neuron, post means after, right? It's the neuron after the synapse. So the postsynaptic neuron is receiving and the presynaptic neuron is sending. All right, a little bit more about neurotransmitters, which are ligands. Right? Hormones, by the way, are also ligands. They bind to a receptor molecule and have an effect in the cell that's received the signal. So to get information from one neuron to the next, you have to exocytose these packets, these vesicles of neurotransmitter. And there are lots of different neurotransmitters. I think we're up to about 100 at this point. Um, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin are some that you might have heard of. If you haven't, don't worry about that. Neurotransmitters are stored within vesicles, right? So think of, remember, recall your cell bio here. We've got neurotransmitters, many of which are proteins. They're produced with rough endoplasmic reticulum, sent to the Golgi to get modified and addressed. So they are towed by motor proteins to the axon terminal or the synaptic terminals of neurons. And they wait there until a signal is given to them to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. All right, so we're going to look at this process of synaptic transmission in a couple of different ways a couple of times because this is one of the really basic things about understanding how the nervous system works. The first thing that happens is that what is called an action potential arrives at the axon terminal. An action potential is a change in electrical potential, is the signal that's being sent. And it's in the form of changes in ion concentration inside and outside the axon of the neuron. We're going to talk more about how action potentials work in the next video. For now, just think it's an electrical signal, right? That electrical signal, the action potential, arrives in the axon terminal or the synaptic terminal, and that leads to the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Ca2 plus is a calcium, that's the symbol for calcium ion. So at a specific voltage, these channels open, or a specific voltage change, these channels open, and that allows calcium to flow down its concentration gradient and into the axon or synaptic terminal. That leads to step three, which is the docking of synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic axon terminal membranes, the presynaptic membrane, and the exocytosis of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Next, in step four, we have diffusion of neurotransmitter across that gap, the synaptic cleft, 
Step five, the neurotransmitter binds to the ligand-gated ion channel, also called a neurotransmitter receptor, on the postsynaptic cell, on the receiving cell, and that leads to a change in voltage charge in the postsynaptic cell. So we've got an electrical signal that's transformed into a chemical signal that once it's the chemical signal is received creates an electrical signal in the receiving neuron, right? Because these channels, when they open, after you bind a hormone, that channel opens and either positive or negative ions are going to be allowed to flow into the postsynaptic cell. All right, so let's run through this again. The first thing that has to happen is an action potential needs to arrive in the presynaptic axon terminal. Step two is opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. And I, I need to point out, right, if there's, no, if there's not enough calcium in the extracellular fluid, that signal is not going to be able to pass to the next cell in the pathway because you don't get exocytosis of neurotransmitter without calcium present in the presynaptic terminal. The next thing that happens is the exocytosis, which is active transport of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. The next step, step four, is diffusion of material across the synaptic cleft. Step five is binding of the neurotransmitter which is a ligand to the receptor, which is a ligand-gated ion channel. Finally, we have a change in charge in the postsynaptic cell, which is referred to as a graded potential. Remember that the inside of neurons is negatively charged with respect to the outside, and the effect of this ion channel opening will depend on what kind of channel opens, whether it's positive, allows positive charge to flow into the cell or negatively charged ions. And this is referred to as a graded potential rather than an action potential because they're fairly small in size. And this is what sums up at the axon hillock and can potentially trigger an action potential. That action potential would be in the postsynaptic cell. So once again for the win, step one, an action potential, sometimes it's called a nerve signal or a nerve impulse, reaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron, the sending neuron, that leads to the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium rushes in, and that leads to exocytosis of synaptic vesicles full of neurotransmitter, and so neurotransmitter release. Step four, neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft Step five, the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, which remember is the same thing as a ligand gated ion channel. And then finally, the influx of ions, which is in fact a change in electrical activity, same thing in the postsynaptic neuron leads to creation of a graded potential. Now when you have a system, communication system, 
That depends on a signal being turned off and on, as does the nervous system. You want to understand what is it that actually turns the signal off. So how do you stop synaptic transmission? Well, there are three basic processes. The first is that there are enzymes in the synaptic cleft that break down specific neurotransmitters, and that then keeps them from being able to activate the receptors. So in the little image here, we've got an enzyme in the gray. The neurotransmitter is the teal. When the enzyme flexes, it breaks the neurotransmitter in two, and then it can no longer activate the receptor. The second way that synaptic transmission is stopped involves proteins in the membrane of the presynaptic terminal called reuptake pumps. So these pumps, and is represented by the sort of hamburger buns here, um, pump, actively pump, so it's active transport, uses ATP, actively pump neurotransmitter or the broken down parts of neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic cell where it's then recycled and reused. The third way is that neurotransmitters simply diffuse away from the synaptic cleft, right? Everything spreads out, and if given the chance, and there, in most cases, there's nothing surrounding the synaptic cleft that holds that, the neurotransmitter there. Reuptake pumps have been um, exploited as what are considered druggable targets for different kinds of um, brain dysfunction. So you might have heard of the drug Prozac. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's associated with um, feelings of calm and also of um, contentment. I wouldn't necessarily say happiness, but contentment. If you keep a reuptake pump, if you essentially create a molecule that blocks this reuptake pump from happening, you end up with more serotonin in the synapse for longer periods of time. So it's more likely to bind to receptors, which is then going to open and lead to increased activity throughout that circuit. So those are the three mechanisms that are used to prevent constant stimulation of a circuit, of a pathway in the nervous system, or constant inhibition, because both of those uh, both can facilitate transmission and you can also inhibit or slow down transmission. All right, I'm going to leave this diagram for you guys to label. The blue lines represent different structures and the dashed green lines represent processes. All right, and if you have questions about that, we can uh, talk about it next week. The next lecture is going to take us into the wild world of the action potential. More about electricity coming up.